this morning. I'm looking at all of you and saying that. It's such a pleasure to be in the house with you this morning. And what an uplifting video. You know, we just came from Easter weekend last weekend reminding us our Savior lives. And, you know, we think about that a lot on Easter weekend, but it's something we need to think about on a daily basis. Amen. He lives. He lives. He's resurrected forevermore. And aren't you so glad? I, that just stirs my heart when I see that. And I think about that part where he said it's not, it's not like God is battling the devil. The devil's already defeated and he already has the victory amen and I'm so thankful just a couple of quick announcements before we go into the service tonight we want to uh, personally I want to say thank you on behalf of my family um, for all your prayers and for uh, the beautiful flowers that um, were were given towards my mother-in-law such a blessing and, and we felt like you all were just some of you were physically there but we knew a lot of you were there in spirit and in prayer and we felt that and it was such a uh, a blessing, and let me just say up front, it's not um, you, you don't find that everywhere. But but we know, we know that you we felt your love and your prayers. Thank you so much. Um, tonight at five o'clock, Brother Andrew is going to be continuing our study in Hebrews. I believe Hebrews ten uh, is what he's going to be looking at, and so we look forward to that. I know it's going to be a blessing. And tomorrow night we will have prayer online at six. So if you have prayer requests, you can text them or post them on our Facebook pages. Let us know about them, and we will bring them to the Lord in prayer. Prayer, and we know God hears. We know He hears our prayers. We're His children, and His ears are open to us. Amen. And then Tuesday night at six thirty. Now let me get it right. Is it Sister Marcia this week? Yeah, I thought I was right. Yay! So I'm on the right pattern now. So Sister Marcia will be used, uh, giving us the youth word this Tuesday night at six thirty uh, online, and then Wednesday night at six thirty is Bible study with a pastor, and we know we're looking forward to uh, that as well. And for those of you that signed up in the foyer for the paint party, that is this. Next Next Saturday, just wow, all of a sudden it's here. Um, and it's April, that's right, April 22nd, that's this Saturday. Uh, if you haven't paid, you can, or you can bring your $20 the morning of, that is fine too. Uh, but basically, we have um, a, a lady that's going to be coming in, and she is going to be, it's Regina's, uh, Sister Regina Beaver's sister who's coming. And I've seen her painting, and she's very talented. And she's bringing the material, she's bringing the the design. I've seen the design. It's going to be gorgeous. Mother's Day is around the corner. You can do this maybe as a gift for someone or you can keep it in your house. But um, she's going to take you step by step. And for $20, I don't know that you go anywhere and do something like that for that amount. But uh, she's supplying everything and she's going to show you how to do it step by step. So if you're interested it's not just open to the ladies. This is men as well. But if you're interested be sure you sign up before you leave today um, so that I can give her an accurate count of who will be here. We will start at 11 a.m. Saturday, and it takes a couple of hours usually to complete. Um, so we'll have a good time of fellowship. I'll, uh, we'll share, I'm sure, some things there as well, and it's just going to be a good time. Eat something before you come. We might have some light snacks, but you don't want to come super hungry. Go ahead and eat before you come, okay? And then, because uh, we want to spend time uh, in, in the, <laughs> in the, in the uh, painting. We don't want to have to take a break, you know, and take a meal break, things like that. So uh, just, I know you'll be in, in uh, enjoy that. She guaranteed me that people who are, who've never even picked up a brush before can do this. She's going to take you step by step. So I uh, know that you'll enjoy that. Also, seniors, don't forget you have a meeting coming up, and it's right around the corner too. Tuesday, not this Tuesday, but the following on the 25th at 1 o'clock right here. Uh, the sister Teresa Sanger is going to be hosting that and she says eat again eat your lunch before arrival but light snacks are also going to be provided there. There's a suggestion box in the foyer for our seniors gatherings. Uh, if you have any suggestions you can put them in there and there's a little bit of homework there. She has something for you to fill out and bring back with you when you show up on senior day and so uh, if you miss the homework she has let her know. I'm sure she'll provide you uh, with some more copies if you need that and uh, I know that's going to be a blessing too. That is for our senior adults. April, uh, that is April 25th, Tuesday at 1 o'clock here at the church. So several things up and coming and we look forward to them all. Amen. Would you stand where you are as we get ready to go to the Lord in prayer this morning? How many of you um, came this morning knowing something that there is to pray about? Yeah, something you know that needs to be prayed about. Amen. We do. I know we have... Um, 
uh, Brother Donald. He is uh, one of our dear friends from Ackerman, <coughs> and he's here with us this morning. His family is dear to us, and um, yes, <laughs> Brother Donald's on the front row up here, and we're proud he's with us this morning. I know he has a special need we spoke on this morning. Uh, we always pray for Brother Gosnell and Shannon, and we want to continue to pray for Sister Joanne, and uh, Charlene is here, but we're lifting her up still in prayer. We are praying for Karen, Linda's daughter. We're not taking her off the list, sister. She's going to stay there a while until the Lord moves. Amen. And of course, we're praying for, there's several of you that have, have things that you're praying about and he strengthen your body, but we know God is able. Amen. Psalm 118 and 14 says, the Lord is my strength and my song. He has given me victory. I see right there, lines right up with what I just started saying this morning. He's already given the victory. When he conquered death, hell, and the grave, he conquered every enemy of ours we'll ever face. Amen. He has given me the victory. That's the promise of the Lord in Psalms this morning. And we claim it. How many of you claim that in faith this morning? We claim that in faith this morning. Amen. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask, let's thank him first for his promises. And then let's ask him to have his way and minister to the needs that have been mentioned here this morning. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you, God. We thank you for the day. We thank you for the time that you've allowed us to come together once again. God, we thank you for your promise. God, we know that they're all true. They are yes and amen. And Lord, we lay hold on them today, the promise that says that you have given us the victory, God, in Psalms. We know that that is a true word from you. And Lord, we stand on it today as we pray for these needs. God, every sick person, every family with a need, Father, every person here today that came with a need and something to pray about, Lord, we lift up to you in Jesus' name and ask that you administer to those things according to your will. Now, Lord, we ask that you would have your way in this service. We pray that your Holy Spirit would have freedom in this house and freedom within us, God, so that we would worship you in spirit and in truth, and God, that we will receive the word that you have sent to us for this day. Lord, anoint your messenger and anoint this time together in Jesus' name and for his glory. And the church said, Amen. Amen and amen. Well, let's worship. How many came ready? Amen. Ready to worship. I came ready to worship. Old song said, I don't know what you came to do, but I came to praise the Lord. That's what I came for. Amen. So let's worship him this morning. We're going to start off with a real old one, but it's a good one. I love the words on this song. Praise the Lord. Yes. 
just feeling just to be, just to be a child of God, God. and how his love say I uh, appreciate so much. We had, uh, I think, probably around 12, 13 of our local church members that was able to come to the uh, funeral. We appreciate you so much. Yes. But as a church body, the way that the phone calls, uh, food, uh, flowers, and uh, the ones that were there, I can tell you, man, the flowers were just beautiful. And we appreciate you so much uh, for giving uh, to that cause because uh, we, we felt your love in a hard time. Amen. That's what family's for, ain't it? We, we're there for each other. But uh, love and appreciate you this morning. Uh, Sister Brenda will be bringing the word this morning. Next Sunday, Brother Andrew is going to be bringing the word. You say, why are we doing that? I'm tired. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drop back punt. We're going to take a couple of weekends down, and they're going to preach, and you'll be blessed because they're just as anointed as I am. And then, um, and then I'll jump back in at the end of the month. Amen? So uh, y'all just uh, pray. When somebody passes, there's a lot of loose ends you got to tie up. Amen? And I uh, pray that God will give me wisdom to do that. How many of you know we ought to pray for God's wisdom? Everything we do. We, because when we put our hands in it, we'll mess it up if we ain't got God with us. Amen? But uh, uh, at this time, let's stand go to the Lord in prayer. We're about to come to you for your tithes and your offerings. How many of you, you that you count that a form of worship? I, I come prepared. I, I always come with, with the envelopes in hand because God gives me everything. Come on now. How many of you know the Lord? He only requires 10%. When you go to the restaurant now, they got two or three different sections. 18%, 20%. Amen. Sure that don't mean we have to give it. Amen. <laughs> but but anyway, it takes it to make the world go round. And, and it takes it. We know when we do what the Lord requires of us, it meets the needs in His house. Amen. <laughs> and what can we do better than to take care of the house of the Lord? Amen. Yes. So let's go to the Lord in prayer at this time. Uh, I'm going to ask Brother Donald over here to say the prayer over our tithes and offerings. It's so good to have him in the house Amen. this morning. Yes. This is a real friend of ours, and his mother-in-law is uh, Sister Maxine Hinton, one of the sweetest people, most godly women yes. I've ever met. So pray for them. They're going to be here the next three months, and hopefully you'll be getting a chance to meet that sweet wife of his, Sister Patty. And she is very, very anointed at singing. Maybe if she comes, we can, uh, we can get her on stage uh, to worship God. God and lead us in worship one Sunday. But uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. I'm going to ask Brother Robert. Uh, now, I'm a, I, I, want you to, I want you to do it, Donald. I've seen that look on his face, but I think he's going to be all right. He won't get mad at me. Say the prayer over our tithes and Amen. 
chorus again. Show me one thing he can't do. Show me a mountain he can't move. He's the God of the breakthrough and anything is possible.
can't do. Show me a mountain he can't move. He's the God of the breakthrough and anything is possible. Show me one thing that's too hard. Show me waters he can't part. He's the God of the breakthrough and anything is possible. Anything is possible. Anything is possible. Anything is possible. Thank you, Jesus. speak to doubt this morning and tell that doubt you know that anything is possible when God's in it anything is possible oh anything is possible hallelujah thank you Jesus thank you Jesus thank you Jesus Lord we know without you we're absolutely nothing but we also know Lord that with you everything is possible anything Lord you have it all in your hands we worship you this morning oh Lord we give you praise we give you glory hallelujah you're worthy Jesus and worship God this morning. Is he worthy to be praised? Is he worthy to be praised? Just praise him. Praise him. Praise him, church. Praise him for what he's done in your life. Praise him. Sing these words unto him. Hallelujah. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. ever breathe we live for you oh we live for you Jesus the name above every other name Jesus the only one who could ever say you're worthy of every could ever breathe. We 
live for you.
sinking sand all other ground is sinking sand sing it again on christ on christ the solid rock i stand all other ground is sinking sand all other ground is sinking sand come on one more time declare it this morning on christ the solid rock i stand all other ground is sinking sand all other ground is sinking sand lord when the world tries to stray us when the world throws us hardballs and hardballs god we place our trust in you you are the author and you are the finisher of our faith, God. Lord, help us to always keep our eyes on you, Jesus. That is the number one thing, no matter what comes our way, no matter how hard pressed we are, no matter how tired, no matter how exhausted we may feel, no matter how down. Lord, we lift up our eyes to the hills from whence cometh our help because our help cometh from you, Lord, the maker of heaven and the earth. So, Lord, we place our trust in you, God, and we stand on you, the solid rock, the firm foundation that will never go away, that will never fade. Hallelujah. Come Thank on, you, Jesus. One more time. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Thank you, Jesus. Aren't you glad there's a place that you can go with Jesus? The solid ground. He doesn't change. He doesn't move. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Aren't you so glad? And holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside. As you're seated, let's just honor the presence of the Lord this morning. He's certainly in this house. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Somebody needs to say, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Somebody 
Somebody needs to say hallelujah. Hi. Can you hear me good on this mic right here? Can y'all hear me well? If not, I can change. I don't mind changing. But turn me. Okay, let's see. Let me get modified here. It might be on me. Now, is that better? Worse? The same. Better? Is that better? Is that better? Oh, I hear, I hear now. Praise the Lord. God's presence certainly in the house this morning. Amen. Amen. Didn't know I'd be speaking today until uh, this past week, about midway through. But I should have known. <laughs> and let me just explain to you why I say that. Um, the Lord has been giving me some things over the last few weeks. And I've been taking notes and I've been writing things down. And the Lord's been showing me some connections. And uh, I thought, well, it'll be good. We are in a study right now, Lord, of Hebrews. But this will be good one day. And then this week I had the opportunity. I was asked, could I speak this morning? And Brother Little said, I don't mean to just throw this at you. I said, oh, no, no. God's been giving me a word all along. And I, I know this is what he wants me to share. This is what I'm going to share with you this morning. What God has been sharing with me, amen, over these last few weeks. And so we're going to be taking our main text out of Matthew 14, if you have your Bible. We're going there to a very familiar passage of Scripture. But the title this morning is Four Steps Out of the Boat. Four. Look at somebody say four. There are four things specifically that God showed me about these four steps of Peter. And really it's not just revolving around him. It's revolving around the whole episode that happened that in that Sea of Galilee in this particular part of the scripture we're going to. But there are four things God showed me that we need to know in the day we're in. Now do you believe that we need to know some things in the day we're in? Some of these things are things you might already have known, but if you're like me and like the students that I teach, sometimes we need to be reminded. <laughs> Amen. My students will say, I'll have, it tickles me so bad, uh, I'll have something written on the board, test, summative test on so and so day. I'll put it up there two weeks ahead of time. Every single day, every Every single class, I try to remind them, either at the very beginning or at the end, I'll say, we have a test in two weeks. That's on such and so day at such and so date. Don't forget it. Even the day before, I will tell them. But it never fails when I go to class the day of the test. Guess what I get asked? We have a test today? <laughs> And I say, where have you been for two weeks? It's been on the board. I've been telling you every day. Sometimes we just got to be reminded. And I do believe that there are some things that the Lord is going to, I believe is going to bring out some things to you today that are maybe reminders. And then I believe you're going to see some things maybe you'd never thought about before. Because there were things I hadn't thought about before that God shared with me. So let's look at Matthew 14. We're going to start at verse 21. And we're going to read all the way through 33. And then I'm going to share with you what the Lord has put in my heart. So let's read. Immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. Notice it said immediately and notice it said he made them go. He asked, he told them, he, he, it was an order go into the boat, go to the other side. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up by the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there but the boat was now in the middle of the sea tossed by the waves for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It's a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, and we all know this, this from Scripture, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and called him and said to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Look at somebody and say four steps out of the boat. That's about what it probably took for Peter to get where he was at when he realized where he was. So what was really happening on this day? I, the Lord wanted me, wants us to see everything involving this event. A lot of times we look at this one thing as though we're isolated. But it wasn't an isolated event that day. 
Jesus, the word said, immediately had his disciples to go into the boat and to go to the other side while he sent the multitude away. Why was there a multitude? If you look before this, we had had, there was a multitude because Jesus had just finished feeding the 5,000 men plus the women and the children. So there's no telling how many were really there. And he had just done this miracle and they had stayed so long through all of his teaching before the miracle that they were hungry. We know the background. So he found a little boy with five loaves and two fish and he blessed it and the Lord multiplied it and he fed all of these people there that day. So now they're there. They've eaten spiritually. They have eaten physically and they don't really want to go home. They want to stay where he's at. And Jesus said to his disciples, now you go and you go now to the boat and you go to the other side which would have been uh, Gennesaret or Capernaum, one version says, which is right there in the same spot. And he says, you go there and wait for me. And now Jesus does what Jesus needed to do. You know, Jesus, how many of you know he was in a physical body like we are? And we get tired sometimes. Can I get an amen? <laughs> I'm learning in my 50s that my physical body, my mind thinks I can do a whole lot more. I still feel in my mind like I'm 20 something years old. <laughs> but my body reminds me sometimes, hey girl, you're not in your 20s anymore. You're in your 50s. And you might want to just take a slower pace. And Jesus, being all God, but yet all human, was tired. So he went to the mountain to pray. He needed time of refreshing with his father. <coughs> Scripture says that in verse 23, evening had come. So we know by that detail that it wasn't evening before everybody had left. There's a few things we got to get right in our timeline here. Evening was a loose term that could have meant, that generally meant sometime around sundown. Okay, sometime around sundown. Now for, uh, for us, or even in Israel, it's usually around 7 o'clock, between 7 and 8, <coughs> according to what I found. But by this time at evening, the disciples' boat, it says, was already halfway across the sea. So we know that Jesus sent them immediately. It was still daytime when he sent them. But now hours had passed. Now just how many hours had passed? Well, if sundown is somewhere around that 7 or 8 o'clock hour, 8 being the absolute latest, it says in the scripture that they're about halfway over, which is about 3 or 4 miles into the Sea of Galilee. And it said in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. Now the fourth watch of the night, and most of you, some of you may know this, Brother Little I think has even expounded on it once or twice, but the fourth night of the watch is between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. Now let's get this straight. He said that they were in the boat at evening, they were in the boat, and they were already on their way across the sea. That's about 7 o'clock evening time when sundown is. And now here it is between 3 and 6 a.m. that Jesus comes walking on the water. So they've been out in a boat and they've not just been in a boat, they've been in a boat in a storm <coughs> from about 7 o'clock, maybe 8 at the latest, till about 3 a.m. at the earliest. That's a lot of hours to be in a boat on a little old sea and you've only gone 3 miles. Can you imagine? Some of you that are into boating and canoeing to think that you're really making progress and you figure out you've only gone about three miles across this thing and you've been rowing there all that time, all these hours and it's getting darker and darker and the storm wasn't lit up. Hadn't lit up one bit. So Jesus didn't go to them right away, uh, as some might think. He didn't even wait just a little bit. He waited several hours before he ever went to where they were. Now, this step, the first step out of our four steps we're going to look at this morning is that God isn't worried about time. Somebody tell somebody near you he's not worried about time. <laughs> Now, you know, that sounds easy to receive, but it's kind of hard sometimes for us to swallow. We live in a world that is, that is running on time. I know every weekday morning at 4 a.m. my alarm clock's going off. Unless it's a, I'm not in school. Okay, 4 a.m. I can look for it. And I know by 3.10 I'm going to be in a classroom after I've gotten ready and get to work. That's where I'm going to be until 3.10. And at 3.10 I've got to walk out those doors and I've got to stand at duty while the kids go to their buses and watch and make sure everybody gets home safe. And then sometime around 3.30ish maybe I get to leave the parking lot. We run on time. 
some of your time zone time uh, circumstances might be different there are different time zones in this world but everything runs on time but Jesus doesn't run on time <laughs> I love that about him the creator of time is not, uh, he is not uh, subject to what he created, but instead what he created is subject to him. It isn't this like Jesus. Does anybody else remember another circumstance when Jesus seemed to be a little late showing up? I mean, in the Bible, we're told of another circumstance later on in John 11. Whenever his friend Lazarus was sick, Martha and Mary sent word to Jesus and said, He who you love is sick and even to death. And Jesus clearly looked at his disciples, the word tells us, and says, I'm going to stay two more days, then we'll go. And they did not understand it. But it's because he didn't, he is not dictated to by time, but that he controls time. And that ought to give us enough to praise him for right there. Yes. Because it doesn't matter what the doctor says, right. and it doesn't matter what your lender says, and it doesn't matter what your employer says, there is one who is in control of time, and those things are not it. Amen? Yes. When my mother-in-law took her last breath on this side, last Saturday was, uh, this past Saturday was a week, and when she took her first breath in glory, it was not because Briar Hill nurses said, this is the time, Miss Rosemary, you've got to go. It's because the Lord had established a time and nothing was going to interrupt his time. Amen? Yeah, amen. <laughs> That's the way he is. So Jesus in, the, in respect of Lazarus even told them um, that he was going to stay two more days to his disciples and he was glad to do it, he said, <laughs> so that they would believe. He, he actually told his disciples that. And we know he showed up there. Lazarus was behind a tomb and the sisters, they, all, they both had the same response. If you had only been here just a little bit before, if you would only shown up a few days ago, I know you could have done something. The part they were leaving out was the dot, dot, dot. Like I do in text messages sometimes or in my notes I put three dots to show that there's something I'm sort of leaving out and moving on to and that part is Lord if you had been here you could have helped him dot 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 here's the part they left out but now he's in a tomb wrapped up. And now death has succumbed to him. He has succumbed to death. And death has overcome him. And now he's even to the point of beginning decay because they said, surely he stinks. But Jesus is not controlled by time. You see, in our prayer life, we think that time has the greater hand. We pray things and we ask God to move in our circumstance and we don't see him moving right away so the enemy comes to us and the first thing he does is says well either God didn't hear you or either this is not God's plan. Can I tell you that there are things in the word of God that are promises that are ours to claim and when we claim those promises there's not a thing the devil can do about them so he makes us question time. We begin to look at time as an enemy. And we begin, he wants us to transpose that onto the Lord in some way, doubting his word. And this is what we see. They're out in, the, in, in uh, with Lazarus in respect. He is buried. He's already begun to decay. But it didn't matter to Jesus. It didn't matter because he's the one who controls time. And when he called Lazarus forth, Lazarus had to be loosed by the sisters. But other than that, Lazarus was like a brand new man yeah. when he came out of that tomb. So here are the disciples. They're in a boat. They did what Jesus said do. They're here on, in, in the sea. They're in a boat. They don't know what's going on. They don't understand why am I in the middle of all of this great big storm. Jesus hasn't showed up. He's doing something else. He's nowhere near me. Anybody ever felt that way before? I don't know where you are Lord but I just know where you're not. I, I can't seem to see you around where I'm at. That's I'm sure how they they fell in the midst of a storm. But time has no constraint against our God. There's another example in the Bible. You remember when Joshua prayed? Joshua and the Israelites were going against the Amorites. You remember they were in this battle and he prayed and he said, Lord, cause the sun and the moon to stop in their path until we win this battle. And God did it. Time is not an issue to God. Some of you 
have questioned time. I've questioned time. I can't tell you how many times I prayed for <coughs> my mother-in-law and my father-in-law to know Jesus. Most of our married life. I prayed this prayer. I never thought out of the two of them, my father-in-law was the very worst, the very most, the hardest hearted one. He wouldn't get close to hardly anybody. He hated most people. He was a bitter man. And most people didn't like being around him, I can tell you that. They didn't, in his hometown, people just didn't go to his house. You know how you'll just go to your friend's house sometimes, pop in? You didn't do that. You might meet, be met at the door with a rifle or a shotgun or something else. My father-in-law was that type. But I watched that man. We've been married 32 years right at And I, I've watched that man in the last week or two of his life tell his son, when, it, when he was constantly witnessing to him, we were constantly trying to reach him. The man never went to church, hardly ever. And I watched him tell him one day, son, I've been praying. He said, you don't know, I, I have been talking to the Lord some. And I watched him go from a man who woke up every morning cussing everybody for everything they're worth to a man who got quiet and still before God. Don't tell me time is an issue. Don't tell me time is an issue for your problem. You might not have seen the problem solved yet. Say yet. But time is not an issue with our God. And whatever he says he'll do, that's what he'll do. Yes, Jesus is on top of the mountain praying. <clears throat> Don't you think he knew a storm was coming when he said, get into the boat? What do you think? Do you think he knew? Doesn't he know everything is God? Of course he knew. But see, he wasn't worried about the timing of the situation because he has time in his hands. It's not the other way around. He wasn't worried. He wasn't anxious. Neither do we need to be. Look at Psalm 31, 14 and 15. <clears throat> the psalmist said, But as for me, I trust in you, O Lord. I say you are my God. My times are in your hand. My times. Our time is in his hands. So the disciples found themselves in a situation. Here they are. It's a bad one. Their boat's being tossed around by winds and waves. Can you imagine? Now some of the men on this boat were used to the water because some of them were fishermen before. So they knew what it was like to go fishing in the rain. But this was not just any, any ordinary rain. And not all of them in the boat were fishermen. Some of them were tax collectors in their past life. Some of them did other things that never brought them out to the sea. They really didn't know what was going on in this moment. I'm quite sure they were shocked. And the ones fishermen, well, this was an exceptional storm. You're not just getting rain that falls from up here down to you into your boat, but you're getting water that's lapping around. These waves are lapping into your boat from the sides and all around. And there's a wind, see? They're, they're pushing again. They're trying to row against this wind. But for all of these hours that they're out there, they only move three miles worth. Just three. There's a strong wind blowing against them. All this rain is coming against them from down above, from uh, underneath. They don't know what to do. Even the best of the fishermen, Peter, was panicked. They didn't know. But <coughs> that it, the Lord had it in his hand all along. <coughs> so let me ask you this. I know the answer already. Have you ever felt like that? Where it just seemed like you're in the boat? You're, you did what Jesus said. You're out on the, you're in the boat, you're on the water. Jesus said, go immediately. You did, you did exactly what he asked you to do. But then you find yourself out there and you find not only is it coming against you from up here, but you have water all around you lapping over into your boat. You're trying to dip it out and it comes in about as quickly as you can dip it out. And not only that, you have a boisterous, strong gale force wind coming against you as you're trying to, to paddle against it. You ever been in a place where it seemed like one 
thing happen, then another thing happen, and then all of a sudden something slaps you across the face and happens there too. It seems like you turn around and there's always something else or there's something you're battling against here. It's your health maybe, and then you seem to get over that, and then boom, your, your spouse's health is bad or your children, and then boom, something else. You get a, something breaks in the house or some bill comes in the mail, and you don't know what in the world you're going to do about any of it because it seems like all of it is trying to overtake your boat. Oh, yeah, we've been there. Come on. Yeah. So step two is fear is not our future, but our reality. There's a song, nor our reality. There's a song that says fear is not our future. And I like that song. <laughs> but it's not our future, and it's not our reality. See, they were afraid in the boat because the storm was so immense. <clears throat> and even though they did obey Jesus, it did, they didn't avoid the storm. Now, see, this is another lie the devil sends to us. Well, if you were right with God, and if you really did obey God, and if God really did love you, then why are you in a storm? How many have been, ever heard that voice talk before? Oh, I wish you could see the hands. Uh, it's all of us. You know, see, the enemy, he'll come and he'll whisper, Oh, I thought you obeyed God. I thought God loved you. I thought you were doing right by paying your tithes. Well, how come you're short paying your bills this month? I thought you were obeying God. Hey, I thought you stood on the Word of God. Why are you still dealing with a little sickness here? And why are you still having this? Why hasn't He done that? Don't you know there was a moment in the storm? They were there probably, on the minimum, I'd say, five hours. Don't you know there were some moments in that storm where they must have gotten tired of the fight. They were fighting against the wind. They were fighting against the rain. We're fighting against the waves. They probably were getting on each other's nerves. Let's just be honest. You're in a panic situation with each other. And when you feel so comfortable with one another, sometimes you just let it out and you get aggravated with one another. And they've got all this going on in the midst of their storm. And see, you know there had to be a moment because they're human like we are. If we have this life for the enemy to come against us and say, well, then why is all this into you, you surely must not be a victorious Christian, because after all, look at all that's happening. God hadn't heard you. Look at what you're experiencing. See, they had to have felt the same thing. They were not superhuman. They were human, just like me and you. So here they are. We understand this is all going on. They're tired. Fear begins to lurk. And when Peter calls out to Jesus, when Jesus begins to walk out toward them in that fourth watch, we all think it was because of his great faith. And yes, it did take faith. I'm not taking anything from Peter. Nobody else got out of the boat. Okay? But I, I'm here to say that I believe that it was a little bit out of desperation. They were in a very desperate place. And if something didn't change, this is how they felt, they weren't going to make it to the other side. They felt like they were going to be tossed over. How do I know that? When well, the scripture didn't say, when they saw him coming toward them on the water, they said, it's a ghost. <laughs> what does a ghost represent? <laughs> ghost tends to represent death or a remnant of something that once was alive. They kind of felt like they were in a situation there where either they were about to die or that they're in their very desperate circumstance, they had no hope whatsoever of making it out. Now they were praying. They were crying out. I'm sure they were. But for all of these hours, nothing had changed. They were tired. Come on, let's be real this morning. They were not superhuman Christians. They were humans like us. And they were tired. I'd be tired. I wouldn't last five hours rowing a boat in a storm. I can promise you that. Give me about ten good minutes at best. <laughs> and I'd probably laid down in the boat and said, Lord, if it's my time, <laughs> just come on and take me, God. But I can't do this anymore. You know, I get asked and invited all the time to um, by Andrew and by the Arringtons. You can be our guest at the gym. Come on down. I think I've been once. <laughs> once. <laughs> and that's about it. And I always tell Andrew, thank you for inviting me. But in my mind, I'm like, let's sweep that on out of the way. I don't have time for that. <laughs> I'm not your physical person here. You know, I'm all into the music and the art. And I like those things, sitting down, reading things, figuring things out. I'm not the physically inclined. So I know me. I wouldn't have lasted five, six, seven hours in a boat in the midst of a storm. I'd have probably given up in five or ten and said, here I am, God. I'm ready for you to take me. I'm ready if you're ready. But they were struggling. <coughs> they knew that the Lord had told them to meet him on the other side. And here they are. 
they're in a desperate spot. That made me think about Moses. Y'all know the story. When Moses did what God said do, he obeyed God. What happened? He brought the Israelites out to the Red Sea. And big dog, if when he got there, he didn't know how he was going to get around it. There's no boat. God didn't say, hey, go to that boat over yonder. There's enough boats there to carry out. There was no boats. There was no path that he saw he could walk around the sea. And all the time he's got the enemy on his back pressing in. Not a small army. This was a large army. And they had force and power with them. They had weapons. And here they are breathing down his neck, so to speak, as he's brought the children of Israel to yet another barrier that, they, that was in front of them. But God, like Jesus, when he said, come, God spoke to Moses. And he said, come on, Moses. I'm going to part these waters. And we know what God did. As those walls of water were formed, they walked across on dry ground. And all the enemy could do was make noise and watch. They couldn't do one blessed thing but watch. Oh, I imagine they probably kicked up a little fuss. They probably yelled across there if they, if they had any way to. The Bible also says God provided a, bar a barrier there. So they might have been yelling. The children of Israel may not have ever heard it. But I can imagine they would have. Most bullies do. They make a lot of noise. And while they're over there doing all of that, God is delivering his people through the, what used to be the Red Sea. It was dry ground that they came across. And I'm sure that because both of these, the disciples and Moses, had obeyed at their greatest moment of need, because they had obeyed God and what He had said to do, even though it didn't seem like things were changing, that's what got them the victory. That's what brought them the victory. Jesus came walking out to the disciples between that fourth watch, 3 and 6 a.m., and they were afraid. They thought it was a ghost. They thought it was over. But can I tell you, in our most uncertain moments, and some of it's not just my family. We've had, a, we've had some unsettling, you know, with, with, with uh, death is always unsettling. Even when they're ready to go, you just, you know, you feel that. But I can look across the crowd today, and I'm telling you, and you know it, we're not the only ones who's gone through something over the last few weeks, or over the last month, or over the last year. I'm looking at faces, and I know you've been under attack. And I know that some of you have thought in your own minds and hearts, well, Lord, I've done everything I knew to do. I thought I was being obedient. Why am I under attack then? But Jesus wants us to know, like he did for those disciples in that moment on the sea, we're not to be afraid. We don't need to fear. That's a very simple, simple word to say don't be afraid or a statement. But it's not so simple when you're facing what you're unsure about. You ever been unsure about your health before? When COVID was around, a lot of people were. Have you ever been unsure about your bills before? And finances? I can raise a hand. You ever been unsure about some of your relationships with other people? You thought they were mad at you, that they were had something against you. You didn't understand why? Hey, that's me. You ever been unsure about your jobs before? Well, you were just wondering if I'm going to have one if I show up on Monday. Are they going to offer me a contract next year? Everybody else got theirs. Mine's a little bit late here, Lord. What's going on? You ever been unsure about your children, your grandchildren? You ever had any unsure thoughts? Things you weren't positive about? See, with unsurety comes fear. That's what happened to them. They were unsure. They didn't know what else to do. They'd done everything they knew to do in the boat, but they didn't know what else to do. So fear came. And the Lord wants us to know we don't give in to fear. Fear, remember step two, fear is not our future and it's not our current situation. Fear is not. It's a human reaction. We are born with it. Have you ever seen the babies when their daddies are tossing them up in the air? Until they get used to that little game, the first thing that happens if you give them a little toss is they quiver. <laughs> you ever seen them do that? Or if, if you're swinging them in the basket and you let the basket go a little too low, this is their reaction. It's fear. We're born with it. It's a natural reaction. And the Lord doesn't say you don't have fear, but he said don't be afraid. See, we all have the, the emotions. We are born with them. They're there. We can't deny that. But he says don't stay in fear. Don't be afraid. 
That's what his message to the disciples were. Do not fear. First thing out of his mouth. Do not fear. It's me. It is I. Is what he said. Don't fear. Doubt causes us to fear. Jesus didn't want them to be afraid because fear, we know, counteracts what? Faith. Hebrews 11 and 1. Now faith is the substance of things asked for, the evidence of things not seen. See, faith isn't what we see and feel at first. I mean, it's not faith if we can see and feel it. It isn't seeing even a glimpse of the answer. No, no, no. Faith is not for the weak of heart because in every situation, faith by this definition in Hebrews 11 and 1 says, this is what I need. This is what I don't have. This is what I really can't even see it happening. I can't even feel it happening. It doesn't look like it's changing. But I know God will answer anyway. And I know he'll provide it anyway. That's faith. And that's, faith is not saying it in the moment that I feel good in church. Oh, I feel pepped up now. I can say, I can trust God. Yes, God is going to come through. But faith is in tomorrow whenever I feel in the dirt and in the pits and I don't feel anything at all. I get up on a Monday morning and I'd much rather be anywhere but where I'm supposed to be, which is at work teaching eighth graders. And faith is saying, hey, I'm putting one foot in front of the other anyway. I want to get up. I'm going to shower. I'm dressed. I'm going to my job. I'm going to do exactly what I'm supposed to do because I know God's going to meet me there. He's going to go with me. He's going to provide for me. That's faith. Amen. Amen. And it's not easy to do when you're not feeling it in the moment. See? Those disciples were not feeling faith in the moment. I'm sure that they were challenged. And the devil's out to steal, just like he was trying to steal from them in the moment. He's out to steal whatever he can from us. And he most definitely wants to kill our hope concerning the promises of God. And the main thing he wants to steal is our faith. But God is reminding us, do not be afraid. Look at your neighbor and say, don't be scared. Don't be scared. <laughs> we don't know what the next moment holds. Who's to say? You know, back when COVID was, was in 2020, back when all that was happening, um, we were meeting in church still with precaution, but we were. And then all of a sudden overnight, it was like they were shutting down public places, grocery stores. You don't know what's coming. Our world is unstable. How many of you know that's true? You watch the news, you figure it out real quick. Well, I'm watching people over Overseas fulfill biblical prophecy right now because they're bombing one another and they're coming into collusion with one another. There, there are nations that are joining up that the Bible said would happen in the last day. There's a lot of things going on around us and there are some people, even Christians, who are afraid of these things they see because they know what it means. The end is coming. But can I tell you, there's no reason to be afraid. You remember step one, God's time, time is in his, is in his hands. He's not... And he is not ruled by time. If God gets ready right now to rapture this church out of here, we ought to be thankful and looking forward to it and not afraid of it. Because there are a lot of details I may not understand and loose ends that I may not think are tied up. But God knows that. And he can handle it. Amen? Yeah. We don't have to... Psalm 91, 7 through 13 says, A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only look with your eyes. Shall you look and see the reward of the wicked? So how is it possible when everyone around you seems to be in a bind or having problems or that everything seems uncertain, how is it possible that the things I've already gone through didn't already kill me or did it already make me uh, feel like I was out of my right mind? things in life that you probably asked yourself that question, how did I come through this with a right mind? How am I here today and not affected by so, so devastatedly by the past? Verse 9 tells us, because you've made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. Do you want to get through the storm? Make Him your refuge. Make Him your dwelling place. Put your mind on Him and He'll preserve you through whatever it is you're going through. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. I claim that promise. I don't want the plague of the enemy coming near my dwelling. He can't have my family. He can't have my job. He can't have 
my blessings. God gave them to me. Verse 11 says, For he shall give your angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways in their hands. They shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. And you shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent. You shall trample underfoot. Luke 10 and 19, Jesus told us a very similar thing. He said, Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. God. Jesus himself said this. So we don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be anxious. Fear, it might be a natural emotion that's built into us. But we don't have to live there. And we don't have to claim fear. And we don't have to to, uh, to soul in it, as the old folks would say. We use that word a lot at my house. We don't have to soul in it. We don't have to sit in it and stew in it and be anxious or upset. Anxious, by the way, is the first cousin to fear. Anxiety and stress. You don't have to live there. Oh, you're going to feel it. You're going to have those emotions. And the devil's certainly going to try to bring them. But you don't have to receive them. And you don't have to accept them. And you don't have to remain in them. Because you've been given a word by the Lord himself that says, I've given you authority to trade. You're not waiting on authority. He's given you the authority as a child of God. You already have it in you as a child of God to trade the snakes and the scorpions. In other words, those demon spirits that are coming against you. Those thoughts that they're slinging into your mind, trying to whisper in your ear. Those people that those spirits are using to bring you negativity, you do not have to receive it. If you receive it, it's because you chose to. God's given you authority to say no. Amen. Amen. Over all power of the enemy. All power. I don't care how it presents and what it looks like. It doesn't matter what it sounds like. It doesn't matter who those spirits have used to come against you. You have the authority. So the enemy, just like the disciples in the boat that day, he's trying to topple our boat. He wants to drown us. But see, he doesn't do it with water. He does it with discouragement. And he does it through doubt. But we have the power through Jesus to be victorious. Say we have the power. (laughs) We've been given the power. Matthew 16, I'm going to go back to our story for a second. Verse 28. Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. So Jesus, of course, has come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw everything, the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out saying, Lord, save me. Now step three. Remember, we have four steps. Step three is stay in step with God's word and his plan. Stay in step with God's word and his plan. Scripture tells us here that Peter saw the storm. He felt the wind. He felt the rain. He was afraid. But notice what Peter did. Yeah, he called out and he said, Lord, if that's you. But what you didn't see him do, you did not see him take a step outside of the boat until Jesus said, Come. He stayed in the boat until Jesus said something to him. There are a lot of people today that they'll say they're doing this or doing that with the authority and permission of the Lord when the Lord hadn't said anything. Sometimes you have to wait. Can I share with you, and I know some of you know this is true, some of the hardest points of our ministry, some of the hardest points of our lives as a family and even individually were the times where we had to wait. It's hard to wait. You know, you're looking for an answer. You're standing on the Word. Remember the disciples were obeying God. You're doing all this. And emotions are high. We've all been there. The hardest thing to do when you've asked the Lord something is to wait until you hear from Him. We're not a waiting society. Even in school now, you know, used to back in my day, <coughs> to know what scores you made, 
par the teacher would send home all these papers you, you earned a grade on and mom and dad has to sign it and get it back to school. It's not like that now. A lot of their grades go through this Canvas, this app. And if parents want to keep up with the progress, they log on to Canvas. They can see immediately every score. They can see where their kids are, progressing or not. We're not in a weight society. We want to jump ship when pressures come. We want to jump ship. Come on, somebody get honest with me. When emotions get just right and the pressure gets just right, the first thing in your mind, because I know it happens to me, is, is that same old fight or flight. You know, you, you really just want to run and get away from the problem. You really would just like to get out of the situation and leave it where it stands. But Peter didn't get out until the Lord, the Lord said, Come. <coughs> now, the Bible tells us in the end time, people would believe lies and delusions. What is a delusion? I actually looked that up, being the nerdy English teacher that I am. <laughs> and delusion means a false, fixed belief that isn't liable to change, even in the light of conflicting evidence. In other words, I can show you proof that you're wrong, but you're so dead set in what you think. I could show you proof from now till tomorrow at this time, and you wouldn't change your mind. That's what a delusion is, and we're living there today. Why are there so many arguments? You know, we see pastor talks about it. We see it in news. And Why are there so many people kicking up arguments and conflict about perversive things today? Things that we ought to know are better, but people want to fight about. <coughs> Why? <coughs> Excuse me. Why are there arguments about immorality? Things that we would never have argued about or even questioned some years ago, but now there's an argument about it. And you got so many people that want to prove how they're right and how uh, we're judgmental and wrong. <laughs> Why are there even people in church? that have a problem with doctrine like, and I'm not talking about denominational doctrine. I'm talking about biblical things like forgiveness. Yes. Let's, let's touch home for a second. There's some things that's been done and said. Some of you have gone through some things. And forgiveness seems nearly impossible. Well, in you it is. But in Christ it's not. But the, the, He tells us we have to forgive. He tells us. We can't love Him and not love our brother. How can you love God whom you've not seen if you can't love your brother whom you have seen? That's Scripture. Amen. We're told to forgive. We're told to let go of bitterness and offense. That doesn't mean that if I let go of bitterness and offense, I shouldn't be uh, allowing the devil to up in me every time I think about it. That has to be buried under the blood of Christ. Why do we have these things happening? Because some have already jumped the boat. They've already decided how they're going to feel. They've already decided what they're going to do. And when they made the decision, they didn't make it from the Lord's direction. They made it from their own. They made it from their own feelings, their own emotions. In the boat that day, don't you know those men had feelings? Don't you know they were panicked? I don't think we fully get probably how they really felt. I've tried. And I, and I think it's far more intense than we realize. But you know, in that moment, Peter cries out, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come. But he wouldn't do it until the Lord said, okay, come on out. They wouldn't abandon the ship. It didn't seem like when he stepped out, did you ever think about this? When he stepped out of the boat, it didn't seem like anything changed. <laughs> he said, Lord, tell me it's you. Tell me to come. He says, okay, come. He swings that leg over that boat. He swings that other one over the boat. And he takes a step. And he, I imagine he's pretty shocked. I would have been. I, I don't think I would have made it four steps. I just don't. I'd have probably been utterly amazed. And about the time my toes hit the water, I'd have probably been, been like, whoa, sinking. But he took a few steps out of the boat. But as he's taking these steps out of the boat, nothing 
around him changed. The wind is still blowing. In fact, the Bible said that's what it caught his attention. When he took those little three or four steps, the first thing he realizes is, whoa, this wind is still blowing against me. It's trying to push me down. The waters are still lapping up, up, my knee, up to my kneecaps almost. I mean, the waves are, I'm still feeling the rain and, and nothing had changed. And that's why he began to sink. That's why he began to sink and why Jesus had to go and, and help him up. He said, little faith. So, it just like how we are sometimes. Remember when Lazarus and the sisters, I mentioned them before, they, they didn't think that their request had been heard by Jesus because he showed up late. And they really didn't think anything was going to change until the resurrection. Now they had faith for that. They said, oh yeah, he's going to be fine in the resurrection. That's when Jesus told them, I am the resurrection. Yeah. Yeah. When Jesus shows up, everything changes. Even though it might look the same to you, even though you're still feeling the pushback of that wind that's blowing against you, even though you're feeling all of this rain that's trying to smother you and all of the waves lapping up on your legs as you're standing firm in the, in the Word of the Lord, it doesn't look like things have changed. But can I just tell you they're going to change because the elements of this world, just like the elements of the underworld, they answer to Jesus. When Jesus Jesus told Peter to come. I wonder what would have happened. You know, Jesus was the one, the Bible says, when he got back in the boat with him, the storm ceased. I wonder what would have happened if Peter had kept walking in faith, despite the fact nothing had changed. In my mind, I wonder if that's not when the storm would have died down, when he reached Jesus. And then maybe they would have gone back to the boat together on that still water, walking on it. You see, the Lord hadn't brought you out in your boat to abandon you. He didn't cause you to come into these things that you, we all encounter in life to abandon you there. And He doesn't want you to feel like, because you're praying and asking for God to move things in your life, just because you haven't seen them change, that's not any proof at all that they're not going to. Because when you pray in faith and you take steps of faith, like Peter did, things are going to change. Amen. So, let's look at step four. This is the last one. We have to keep reminding ourselves of who God is and what He's promised because there are more miracles in store. Look at somebody and say, there are more miracles. There are more miracles. Now, do you believe that? That's the question. See, verse 31 says, Immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught Peter and said to him, Oh, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? And when they got to the boat, the wind ceased. Then those, I found this real interesting. I've never seen this before. Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly, you're the Son of God. But see, Scripture didn't say the people that were on the banks saw this miracle happen. And they fell on their knees and said, Oh, he's the Son of God out there in the boat. It said, those that were in the boat fell and worshipped him. That's the disciples that were in the boat. The disciples fell and worshipped him. And look at their proclamation. Truly you are the Son of God. Now I told you in the beginning what had just happened before they got on this boat. They just witnessed the feeding of 5,000 men, not counting children and, and women. They had just come away from a very miraculous thing. It's so miraculous. It's so abundant. The Bible tells us in that account that they even had enough baskets left over for each of the twelve to take back with them. Abundance of God shown that day. And here they are in the boat. And when Jesus gets on the boat with them and the storm finally calms, they said, truly you are the Son of God. <laughs> Mark 6 and 52 of this account says, for they had not understood about the loaves, talking about the disciples, because their heart was hardened. Now that's the disciples on the boat. How is it they had a hardened heart when they had just seen all these miracles transpire? They're just like we are. You know, I'm not trying to down those guys. I'm just showing you what I know is true about me, and I can promise you it's true about you. God can do miraculous things in your life, but let the first big storm come by in your life. It's human nature. We're going to question, Lord, where are you? God, why am I enduring this? 
God, you know, I'm feeling this way. Why am I, why am I not seeing you move on my behalf? Why aren't you talking to me, God? You've been quiet for a while. I don't know that I'm hearing from you. I don't know what I need to do. See, they were in that same place. Could it be, just a question here, why their hearts were hardened? Because they had just been in the abundance and the overflow and the blessing of God. And all of a sudden they found themselves in the middle of the worst storm they'd ever faced. See, the devil likes to do that to God's people. Those questions I talked about before that he'll bring to you, well, if you are truly a child of God, then why isn't he helping you? Then why is it bad for you? Why did you have to go through this? Why did you have to go through that? Some people go through things as children. They become adults. They don't understand why they had to go through that as a child. And the devil torments. He'll bring that back. You had parents that split up. You had parents that divorced. You had a husband that cheated or a wife. Or you had this or you had that. Why? Where was God in the middle of your roughest storm? When you were a kid and people took advantage of you, why didn't God stop that? That's the number one question atheists ask. If God is God and there really is one, then why do bad things happen to people? Well, the disciples were there that day. They'd just been in the very abundant blessing of God, and now they're in the roughest storm they'd ever seen. What was, the, what was it that made their heart so hard? They were in the roughest part. The roughest thing that they'd ever encountered. They didn't know how they were going to get through it. And somewhere along the way, remember step five is remembering who He is and what He's promised. Somewhere along the way, they lost what Jesus had said. In the very beginning, Jesus said, hurry up, get in the boat, go to the other side, and I'll meet you there. Somewhere along the way, their path on their boat represents our life. Somewhere along the way, they lost the direction and the point that Jesus was making. What was he saying? Number one, you're going to be on the other side. Get in the boat. I'll meet you there. That's the second thing. If you're not going by yourself, I'll meet you when you get there. Didn't Elijah have a similar situation? When he trusted God at Mount Carmel and God showed up, you know the story about the altar being uh, soaked with water and the sacrifice and God proved himself. Right after that, they had killed all the false leaders of Baal. And right after that, word gets to Jezebel and one lady says, Elijah, when I catch up with you, I'm going to hunt you down, boy, and I'm going to kill you the minute I find you. I'm going to destroy you. And Elijah became, uh, the next thing we know, he became afraid and he was running away, trying to find a place to hide. And that's exactly what we see here. But we also know Elijah didn't stay in that cave he didn't stay in that cave, cave hiding. Jesus showed up. The Lord showed up. God spoke to him and said, Why are you hiding, Elijah? I've got all these other prophets just like you. They've been through stuff, but they're enduring. Why aren't you? You need to go back down where I sent you to go in my power and in my authority. Remember, Jesus gave us authority. Go back down there in my authority and live out in my authority what I told you to do. And Elijah did. In the miracle of the 5,000, we know uh, that it was an abundant thing. But here they left, the disciples in this worst storm they'd ever seen. But right in the middle, look at this now. Right in the middle, what comes after the storm? Let me, let me get there. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. When they came to the other side, the Bible tells us the end of this chapter, 14, Matthew. It says that all the people in that region, in Capernaum and in Gennesaret, showed up with their sick. And that Jesus began to heal them. And his disciples were there, of course, to help bring the people to Jesus and all of that. But they immediately miracles resumed. So you have miracles of the five, the miracle of the 5,000, and also the abundance of the bread and the leftovers that were taken up for the disciples. You have a storm, which, by the way, there was a miracle in that too. The miracle was that, that he came out to them walking on the water, and he calmed the storm. And then you have miracles right after the storm. What does that tell us? It tells us no matter what season we're going through, there are miraculous things that God has for you. Things He wants to do for you. Even if you're in the season of storm, there are miracles waiting for you. 
If you're in the a season of abundance, there's miracles still waiting for you. And if you're in a season of searching, because they came searching for Jesus when he came over on that other side, there are miracles that he has for you. And they're not just to, so that you can be blessed. He loves you enough that he does want you to be blessed for sure. But he wants other people to see what a miraculous God he truly is through your life through the mountains, through the valleys. When you're in that boat on that torrentous, just terrible sea, or if you're on land safe, no matter where you are, what season of life, there are miracles for you. Amen. Amen. And the second part is, as I close, the Lord's already told us. If we take him by the hand, the disciples were obeying what he said do. If we obey his word, there's coming a day when Jesus is going to take us to the other side. Yeah. And he'll be with us every step of the way. But he's already promised us as children of God. See, the devil wants your attention drawn off of the final peace. That's what happened to the disciples. They were in the midst of the greatest storm of their, they'd ever been in. And for a moment, they lost, they lost focus on what Jesus had already said. Hey, you're, you're going to be on the other side, and I'm coming to meet you. See, they lost that for a second. That's what the devil does to us. That's what he wants to do to you. When you're worried, anxious, stressed, and all of these things are running, all the what-ifs and maybes and, and parts of your life are strolling through your head, and you're so consumed with that, we lose track of what Jesus has said. Jesus tells us that we need to persist because one day, there's coming a day when we're going to another place. John 14 said, Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. This is his direction to us. See, we're living in this life right now. Some of you are in that, to rent that boat that is surrounded by all the storm. Some of you have already made it past the storm right now. Maybe you're on the banks. But he's talking to all of us when he says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me, because in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. This is not the ending place, folks. That where I am, there you may be also. Philippians 3, 20 and 21 said, For our citizenship is not here, it's not Mississippi. My citizenship is not in Rankin County. My citizenship is in heaven, as verse 20 says, for which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body. Praise God for a new body one day. He's going to transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to His glorious body according to the working by which He is able even to subdue all things to Himself. There's proof again. He has time in his hands. He, everything is subdued under his hand. So this is not our stopping place. There is a place for the child of God. We can't lose track in this world of what's to come. Some of you dealt with some physical pain. Don't get caught up in the physical pain. Remember who the healer is and keep your eyes on what he's promised he's going to do. One day you're going to get a new body. If you don't get healed on this side, you will be healed there. And there is a final place for the children of God. And it's not this one. I've heard people say, oh, they think the grave is the stopping place. They think the grave is the last place. They've got a real, they're going to have a real stark reminder one day of those words. When they look him face to face and they realize the grave was not the final place. But there is a heaven for the children of God to go to when we leave this world. He's reminding us of these simple steps today. Don't worry about time. Four simple steps. Don't worry about time. God's not worried about it, so we shouldn't either. We just need to have faith. Step two, fear is not our future or our reality, not as a child of God. We don't have to embrace fear. We do not have to embrace stress. We do not have to embrace anxiety. We can take it to the Lord. Step three, stay in step with God's Word and His plan. And step four, I don't care if you did. I do this. I've told you before, I'll write out things to remind myself. Sometimes I'll, I'll put them where other people can see them in my house. Sometimes they're in my phone or my iPad where I know I will see them. But you need to remind yourself of who God is and what He has promised. 
because His promises are true. Amen. Would you stand where you are as we get ready to go to the Lord in prayer? I pray this morning. I know God gave me the word. Now, if it didn't suit you, it sure suited me. But I feel like it suited a lot more than me. I feel like there's been a lot of people right in that boat for a little while on some things in your life. They might not be the same things I'm encountering. Remember, they didn't have all fishermen in the boat that day. But they all had one thing in common. They all cried out and needed Jesus. And that's all of us. We all need Him. We need His strength. We need His guidance. We need His protection as we go through this world. Amen? Because there's a better place beyond this one. And I plan to go there. What about you? I plan to be there one day. That's what I've set my sights on. My sights are not of this world. They're not of the things that this world can offer. Oh, but my sights are on heaven and being with the one who rules it all. Amen. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, as we come to you, God, at the close of this service, Lord, we thank you for your promises and your reminders that you are for us and you're not against us. And Lord, we thank you that as your children, you've given us promises that we can lay hold on to. Lord, no matter what our circumstances might be, Lord, no matter how rough or how calm our life might be at the moment, Lord, I know there are needs in this building. I know there are needs because you gave me the word. And I know there are needs because you allowed me to understand that as I was given the word that some people here have been struggling. Some people here have been in the storm. Some people are battered from the storm. They're not in it anymore, but they might feel battered from the ones they've been in. But Lord, I thank you for your word because in your word we find hope. We find healing. We find strength. You are our strength, God. And so today I pray that, Lord, as each family and person and individual, as they go throughout this day and this week, Father, I ask that you would bring back something from this word that you have given to encourage them, and, Lord, that it would feed them spiritually to take that next step, Lord, not to be afraid, not to be afraid of the storm going on around us and in the world around us and the politics of the world and everything that's that's going on, Lord, but to look up because we know, God, our redemption draws nigh. It's drawing nigh to us. And Lord, I just pray your blessing on each one and that your will would be done. In the name of Jesus, we give you the praise. Amen. Do you need to say anything? God bless you. Love each other on your way out the door. Hug somebody's neck and say something encouraging to them. Amen.